Well, hello there. Welcome back to my channel. This is the Unintentional ASMR Book Club. If you're new here, thanks for joining in. You're just in time for the bedtime stories. Tonight's book is called Mad Honey. This is a novel, and I will begin the first reading of this book. So, let's begin. Olivia, chapter 1, December 7, 2018, the day of. From the moment I knew I was having a baby, I wanted it to be a girl. I wandered the aisles of department stores, touching doll-sized dresses and tiny sequined shoes. I pictured us with matching nail polish, me, who'd never had a manicure in my life. I imagined the day her fairy hair was long enough to capture in pigtails, her nose pressed to the glass of a school bus window. I saw her first crush, prom dress, heartbreak, each vision was a bead on a rosary of future memories. I prayed daily. As it turned out, I was not a zealot, only a martyr. When I gave birth and the doctor announced the baby's sex, I did not believe it at first. I had done such a stellar job of convincing myself of what I wanted, that I completely forgot what I needed. But when I held Asher, as slippery, slippery as a minnow, I was relieved. Better to have a boy who would never be someone's victim. Most people in Adams, New Hampshire, know me by name, and those who don't know to steer clear of my home. It's often that way for beekeepers, like firefighters. We willingly put ourselves into situations that are the stuff of others' nightmares. Honeybees are far less vindictive then their yellow jacket cousins. But people can't often tell the difference, so anything that stings and buzzes comes to be seen as a potential hazard. A few hundred yards past the antique cape, my colonies form a semicircular rainbow of hives, and most of the spring and summer, the bees zip between them and the acres of blossoms they pollinate, humming a warning. I grew up on a small farm that had been in my father's family for generations. An apple orchard that, in the fall, sold cider and donuts made by my mother, and in the summer had picked your own strawberry fields. We were land rich and cash poor. My father was an apiarist by hobby, as was his father before him, and so on, all the way back to the first McAfee who was an original settler of Adams. It is just far enough away from the, ma from the White Mountain National Forest to have affordable real estate. The town has one traffic light, one bar, one diner, a post office, a town green, that used to be a communal sheep grazing area. 
and Slade Brook, a creek whose name was misprinted in an in a 1789 geological survey map, but which stuck. Slate Brook, as it should have been written, was named for the eponymous rock mined from its banks, which was shipped far and wide to become tombstones. Slade was the surname of the local undertaker and a village drunk who had a tendency to wander off when he was on a bender and who ironically killed himself by drowning in six inches of water in the creek. When I first brought Braden to meet my parents, I told him that story he had been driving at the time. His grin flashed like lightning. But who, he'd ask, buried the undertaker? Back then, we had been living outside of D.C., where Braden was a resident in cardiac surgery at Johns Hopkins, and I worked at the National Zoo trying to cobble together enough money for a graduate program in zoology. We'd only been together three months, but I had already moved in with him. We were visiting my parents that weekend because I knew viscerally that Braden Fields was the one. On that first trip back home, I had been so sure of what my future would hold. I was wrong on all counts. I never expected to be an apiarist like my father. I never thought I'd wind up sleeping in my childhood bedroom once again as an adult. I never imagined I'd settle down on a farm my older brother Jordan and I once could not wait to leave. I married Braden. He got a fellowship at Mass General. We moved to Boston. I was a doctor's wife. Then Almost a year to the day of my wedding anniversary, my father didn't come home one evening after checking his hives. My mother found him dead of a heart attack in the tall grass, bees hallowing his head. My mother sold the piece of land that held our apple orchard to a couple from Brooklyn. She kept the strawberry fields but was thoroughly at a loss when it came to my father's hives. Since my brother was busy with a high-powered legal career and my mother was allergic to bees, the apiary fell to me. For five years, I drove from Boston to Adams every week to take care of the colonies. After Asher was born, I'd bring him with me, leaving him in the company of my mother while I checked the hives. I fell in love with beekeeping, the slow motion flow of pulling a frame out of a hive, the where's Waldo search for the queen. I expanded from five colonies to fifteen, 
I experimented with bee genetics with colonies from Russia, from Slovenia, from Italy. I signed pollination contracts with the Brooklyn Knights and three other local fruit orchards, setting up new hives on their premises. I harvested processed and sold honey and beeswax products at farmers markets from the Canadian border to the suburbs of Massachusetts. I became almost by accident the first commercially successful beekeeper in the history of apiarist McAfee. By the time Asher and I moved permanently to Adams, I knew I might never get rich doing this, but I could make a living. All right, so that was part of that reading. That was the first reading of that book. And if you do enjoy listening to that reading, Give it a like and don't forget to subscribe and share, share it with the world. I wish you well and I wish you have a great night. It's late here and um, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.